extraordinary leader, uh, an extraordinarily distinguished leader who is also a uh, much decorated leader in, in many regards, including the Medal of Freedom. Um, not only was he uh, Ronald Reagan's Secretary of State, but under President Nixon, he was both Secretary of the Treasury and Secretary of Labor. He also headed up the Office of Management and Budget. And what some people don't recall is that he also served in the, uh, in the Eisenhower administration as a very young man on the Council of Economic Advisors. Um, he also, of course, was a professor of economics at both MIT and at uh, University of Chicago. And in fact, you were dean of the business school, weren't you, at University of Chicago way back when? Yeah. Um, way back when. <laughs> <laughs> Before all this public service, he was president of Bechtel, um, and, uh, and of course, uh, he is a Marine. And, uh, and, and uh, better yet, or almost as, uh, or equal to that, is he's the husband of Charlotte Schultz. So, yay! <laughs> I like to think of it, we're going to get to talk a little bit about leadership, which he addresses to some degree in this uh, wonderful book that I really urge you to get. But when I think of George Schultz as a leader, I always think you know, he's got the patience of a professor, right, who really values the learning of his students. He's got, uh, he's got the decisiveness of a business leader, uh, which indeed he has been. Um, he's got the listening ear of a diplomat. Um, and uh, most importantly, he's got the steadfastness, steadfastness the, the steadfast loyalty, steadfast bravery of a Marine. And so that's the kind of leader you're going to get to hear from tonight. So please join me in welcoming George Schultz. Now, the President, President Obama, this week made his case to the nation about why we should respond with a limited strike uh, to Syria's use of chemical weapons. Um, what has this, was he convincing, number one, and what is this episode that we're in the midst of said to you about leadership? What are the lessons to draw? Just as World War II started, I enlisted in the Marine Corps. And I thought I would become a Marine, but that was not true. I became a boot, and I went to boot camp. It's only if you survive boot camp that you become a Marine. But I remember vividly the day my drill sergeant handed me my rifle. He said, take good care of this rifle. This is your best friend. And remember one thing, never point this rifle at anybody unless you're willing to pull the trigger. No empty threats. Mean what you say. Say what you mean. If you make a promise, deliver on it. Now, I told that story to President Reagan at one point when we were in office, and we tried very hard to meet that Marine Corps standard. If you're gonna draw a red line, Think before you draw it what you're going to do it if it gets crossed. If it gets crossed, bang, do it. You didn't do it. Red line was drawn. The Syrians went across it mildly. Nothing happened. So they went across it in a big way. And still nothing's happened. The result of that is our whole credibility has been undermined. Why do I pay attention to what you say if it doesn't mean anything? So I think one lesson I learned from my Marine Corps boot camp experience was always mean what you say. If you mean what you say, if you deliver on what you promise, you can be trusted. And I think in leadership, in many ways, trust is the coin of the realm. If there's somebody your leader that you don't trust, it's not, you, don't, you can't really respond very well. So I think this little incident, sometimes in all your lives, I'm sure in mine, little things that happen to you reflect on them, they have big meaning. And that's a very big meaning for today's uh, problems. 
Now, you worked with the man who coined the phrase, trust but verify. Uh, how do we apply that to the current offer on the table from Mr. Putin? Well, that, I didn't coin that phrase. That was President Reagan's favorite phrase. And Gorbachev got so high, high, tired of hearing it, he would, as soon as it was saying, he would quote it and laugh. But it paid off because as his negotiator, and we finally negotiated, we negotiated the, the first big reduction in nuclear armaments. And the trust verify led to an agreement whereby we had on-site inspection. Not just technical means, we had people who were there and could observe with their own eyes what was happening. Of course, it was reciprocal. But I think that it's a good mantra because you want to be sure if somebody agrees to something, that's going to happen. And maybe you trust, but it's good to verify. Now, take this current scene. I don't know if you've studied at all how difficult it is to destroy a chemical weapon. It's not an easy task. The United States destroyed its stockpile. It was a big job. Suppose you try to apply a stockpile of weapons. You don't really know quite where they are. They're distributed around. You're trying to do it in the midst of a civil war. It's a ploy, and it's worked. It's totally thrown ourselves off stride. And here's Putin writing an article in the New York Times, and he's on the high road. He doesn't know what to make of himself there. He's never been there before. <laughs> he doesn't belong there. But he's sort of saying, look at me. I'm the guy who's for all these good things. I'm along. So uh, I'm very unhappy, and I think everybody is unhappy. Probably the president's pretty unhappy at this point. But uh, we are where we are, and somehow or other as a country, we can't be a country with no president for three more years. We've got to start thinking, how do we reconstruct the situation so we help President Obama be a leader, to be a president that can be trusted and can lead us and get somewhere? And I don't know the answer to that, but that's where we have to find, that's where we have to go. Sticking for a moment with the theme of trust, if you look at public opinion polls in the last several years, for the first time uh, in, a, in a long time, uh, the American public answers the question, do you trust our government to do the right thing? The answer is no by, by overwhelming majorities. And it's been that way about 10, 15 years or so. Um, but it's a, it's a change that, it suggests that there's, there's, some, there's a larger dynamic than who the current president is, who the current con who's in Congress at this moment. But there's some larger trend. Do you have a sense of, of what might underlie that trend? What might drive it? I think a fundamental problem of governance these days all over the world is how you govern di over diversity. Diversity is there everywhere. We're the most diverse country on earth, but diversity is there everywhere. So how you govern over this diversity in an age of transparency, the information and communication revolution cuts very deep. I describe this in my book. And in the past, it's been possible for people to govern over diversity by suppression of it. You can't do that anymore. Because people know what's going on. If there's corruption, they know about it. And, and so you have to figure out how you're going to deal in a better way in these circumstances where there is diversity in this age of transparency. And people have not really kind of conceived of the problem. But I'm trying to point it out. Let me develop our challenge that's sort of coming off this. As I said, I developed this in the book. <coughs> After World War II, some gifted people, starting in the Truman administration, looked back. What did they see? They saw two world wars. 
The first one was settled in rather vindictive terms that helped lead to the second. So they said, let's not do that again. In the Second World War, 70 million people were killed, let alone the injured, the displaced, and the mayhem. There's a book you may have looked at called Savage Continent. It's about Europe right after World War II. And the human savagery that you read about, you can hardly imagine. So they saw that. Then they saw the Holocaust. They saw this unimaginable things that human beings did to other human beings. You couldn't believe it. Ronald Reagan had a job in the military as a military Air Force officer, and one of his jobs was to find film and work it into a process that could be shown to the high brass so they get a feel for what was going on. And he saw the films of the Holocaust. He told me he looked at these films. It was unimaginable that any human being could do this to other human beings. Bernardo produced his film for the high brass, but he saved some for himself. Because he said, pretty soon people will say, I don't believe it ever happened. So I'm going to have a film to show it, to show this thing. So they saw the Holocaust. They saw the Great Depression. They saw the protectionism and the currency manipulation that aggravated them. So they said to themselves, what a crummy world. And we are part of it, whether we like it or not. So they set out to do something different. And as they're getting going, they saw that there was a Cold War going on with the Soviets. So ideas were produced, Bretton Woods system, the Marshall Plan, containment, NATO. And these ideas were developed and institutions worked on them with their ups and downs, but through a long period, almost on a bipartisan, nonpartisan basis. Gradually, there was built a security and economic commons. I think by the time Ronald Reagan left office, the Cold War was all over but the shouting, and then continued on through the first Bush administration, the Clinton administration. You could say, we had a security and economic commons. We benefited from it, everybody benefited from it. Now almost suddenly, that is falling apart. And there are various reasons for it, which I outline in the book. But one of the most important is the emergence in a big way of the uh, information and communication revolution. So I think the problem, the challenge, that we face as a country, as a world, but if you look at what's happened and how the security and economic commons got built, really almost everything constructive that happened happened with leadership from the United States. That doesn't mean we got our way and we told them, we, but we provided ideas, we provided leadership, we provided direction, we provided a certain amount of muscle, and a lot got done. And now we are in this world awash in change. And it's going to stay that way unless people start putting the pieces together. And that's what we have to do. And I try to address this a little bit in the book and say we've got to govern better. We've got to get our economy straightened out. It's a piece of cake to straighten out our economy. It's just waiting to explode. <laughs> We got to get our energy business. I think we have not been handling the problem of addictive drugs well. Then we have to conduct a strong diplomacy. Personally, I think we better address the problems of nuclear weapons and the threat they pose. And then we have to realize that we've got to get the United States back in a strong position, willing to lead and with the ability to lead. So as we that's think, that's an outline of my book. That's a, yes. Now you've got the outline. 
But, but let's, let's go back on, because you're, you're describing a period of extraordinary social innovation, the immediate post-war period. Um, and now we've had this dramatic technology innovation in the case of, of information and uh, communications technology. It's also the case we've had extraordinary innovation in energy technology, as, as your book points to as well. Um, as you think about uh, our going forward, I wanted to, to first get a sense of whether you think the current institutions that we have in place, those immediate post-war institutions, are adequate to the task in a much more fast-changing world, like the UN, like the Bretton Woods Green, uh, institutions. Well, the Bretton Woods system, the exchange rate part of it, uh, couldn't stand up to what's happened. And we now have a perfectly workable, flexible exchange rate system. That's not a problem. But uh, we must hold the trading conventions in place and expand the open trading. That's gradually happening. One of my favorite um, little stories is about the arrival of North America. All of a sudden, without people realizing it, it's here. We had the North America Free Trade Agreement. And since that was signed in the early 90s, signed incidentally and negotiated by President Bush number one, the ratification process was handled by President Clinton brilliantly. So it has a certain bipartisan tinge to it. But since that time, without anybody realizing it, in response to natural forces, North America has arrived. Mexico, Canada, and the US are each other's biggest trading partners. Legally, legally, around 230 million people a year from these countries move around in each other's countries. That's a big number. Our imports from Mexico are 40% US content, 25% from Canada, 24% from China. In other words, the process is integrated. Now, if you look demographically at Mexico, fertility has gone like that. And fertility in Mexico is down to the replacement level, or maybe a little below. So this big, huge bulge of Mexican youth is disappearing. Meanwhile, if the reforms in Mexico take hold, and they seem to be making reasonable progress, Mexico's economy will get very strong. It shouldn't be a surprise that last year, the next net immigration of Mexicans to the US was zero. Our problem is not the US-Mexican border. We're focusing on the wrong border. The border to worry about is Mexico's southern border. Call it North America's southern border. And we need to be trying to help Mexico avoid becoming a transit country with all the human degradation and corruption that goes with that. So anyway, uh, that's an example of the sort of thing that can happen. So and I think it's a good, good development. Go in fact, you, you often talk about the importance of the tending to the garden at home. Yeah, so, so tending to the garden at home. Well, look at the United States. I'm in the process of researching carefully, but I think the narrative I'm going to take is really is correct. Our founding fathers said to themselves, these 13 states that we're trying to make into a country are very different from each other. So we're going to have to put together a form of government that recognizes that. So they designed a form of government that was and still is unique in the world. They created a federal government with limited powers, which were checked and balanced within them. Think about it. Almost everything that affects your daily life is reserved to the states and the communities. Because they said, there's no reason why we should, Boston should be like Birmingham. They're different, so what? Let them be different. The Constitution 
recognizes diversity, allows for it, doesn't try to stop it. But we need to watch out because over time, the federal government has gradually moved itself in to this state territory, the preemption clause, the commerce clause, the taxing authority. The taxing authority has recently been used to say to you, you must buy something you don't want. Wow. I got to buy something I don't want because the government tells me I have to, and if I don't, the IRS is going to get after me and penalize me? Wow. I think there's going to be pushback on this because the diversity in our country will assert itself. Look at Turkey right now. The president of Turkey, who was elected democratically, reasonably popular, decides to take over a square, ancient square in Istanbul and build a building on it. And what happens? Explosion. It's as though the president comes to San Francisco and says, I'm going to wipe out Chinatown, build a building there. What would happen? We'd say, get out of here. <laughs> but uh, you've got to figure out how you're going to govern over diversity. And I think our founding fathers had a lot of foresight in this. But you look all around. The I was talking with a friend of mine from Sweden. And they've had these uprisings in Sweden. I said, come on, what's going on, Sweden? And she said, well, it wasn't among the Swedes, but we now have immigrants. That's where the problem was. I said, aha, uh -huh. for all these years you've been governed over homogeneity. Now you have diversity on your hands. That's a different problem. So I think it's an issue that we will have to confront. And it's related to this problem of trust because with the information and communication age, it turns out that there's a lot of lying been going on. There's a lot of corruption that we know about that we didn't know about. And somehow that's got to be recognized, dealt with, and people have to recognize they're governing in a fishbowl. That's life. Get used to it. So you emphasize in your book the, the importance of information and communications technology and sort of uh, as, as a driver of change. There's another one you point to, and that's demographics. So the combination of, the, on the one hand, uh, an aging demographics in OECD countries in the developed world, um, and a very different ratio between those who are uh, producing wealth, those who are working, uh, participating in the economy, and those who've retired. Um, but it, you also got the problem of the youth bulge in various parts of the world as well. How will these two dynamics place stresses on, on both the governance of, of individual states, but also some transnational issues? Well, demographic changes are clear. So you can see them, and you need to develop a strategy for dealing with them, because they're right there in front of you. The US has a reasonably balanced demography, particularly when we take into account our immigration, unusual among developed countries. But still, we have a rapidly growing aging population. And our retirement and health in retirement benefits are based on assumptions that are not now correct. So we're going to have to get a hold of these issues and do something about them. And it's hard. It's going to be hard. But our problems are as nothing compared with some of the other countries involved. Let me just tick off a few examples. Russia has a demographic catastrophe on its hands. His fertility has been very low for quite a while. In Russia, men only live to the age of 60. Women live 12 years longer. So, and a lot of Russia's best young people are leaving. Silicon Valley's full of them. So they're a country that is built on high prices of oil and gas, which may not last. So they have a big problem, and demography is an important part of it. One of the most interesting democracies is China. 
Because beginning about 30 years ago, a trend started and it was reinforced by the one child policy and fertility dropped like a stone. That meant that China for 25 quarter of a century had a rising labor pool and a shrinking number of people that the labor pool had to support. Called a demographic dividend. Now, these population cohorts are moving along and that's about to change. I think quite suddenly, like throwing a switch. And all of a sudden, the labor pool will start to shrink as the one-child policy cohorts come in. And the number of people the labor force has to support are going to rise rapidly as the, rapid, as the large cohorts that are getting older go into retirement. So China has a reverse problem. And I might say, in addition, the rapid economic growth that China has had is the product of two things. Number one, growth in the active labor force. And number two, growth in the productivity of the labor force. And the productivity increases have come from movement from rural to urban areas where the value added has been higher. Probably they have skimmed the cream off that. But anyway, what it has done is mean it means that these people who are aging are living in cities. If you study Chinese history over the centuries, you see that the basic security net has always been the Chinese family and community. They take care of the young, they take care of the old. That's been China. Now all these people are in cities. I was talking with a well-placed, important Chinese official the other day who was here for a conference at Hoover, the woman. And I mentioned this to her. She said, yes, I live in an apartment with my husband and my daughter, and I don't even know the people in the apartment house. So these are big problems that are going to face. In the Middle East, North Africa, the populations are very young. And for, in a great many cases, the young people don't have anything much to do. It's, in, it's always a worthwhile, I think, to remind yourself that the spark, it was only a spark, but the spark that set off this Arab awakening was a little guy in Tunisia. And he wanted, he was a little entrepreneur, he wanted to make a business selling fruits and vegetables. The regime demanded a bribe, he wouldn't pay it, and they squashed him. And when he was setting himself on fire, he said, why are you doing this to me? All I want to do is make a living. All I want to do is work. They wouldn't let him. And that was vivid in people's minds because it was so widespread. So I say in the Middle East, with I mean, it is in turmoil and there are lots of reasons, but it isn't going to get straightened out until they learn that there is a diversity there they're not going to be able to suppress it as in the old days. They're going to have to learn how to govern over it. They're also going to have to create societies where people have work to do. Because work attaches you to reality. And work gives you dignity. You feel, I got something because I deserved it. I did some work that was worthwhile and I got paid for it. And so I'm proud of myself. So these are some of the issues around, and a lot of them spring from demography. It's a very, it's an important subject to be watching, I think. The, uh, in, in your book, I think you use the phrase, I, I think I've got this right, the, the dignity that comes with knowing you earned what you're paid. Absolutely. And that's a very powerful phrase. It is. Because yeah. the, the other side of that is, of course, the situation like Saudi Arabia, where you know, there are folks that are underemployed, right? Talented, well-educated folks. But it isn't that they're, uh, you know, that they lack the resources, that their basic needs aren't being met. But that notion of knowing you earned what you're being paid is, is what they are denied under that. Uh, yeah, that but they have an odd, set, an odd ethical set. If you build a project in Saudi Arabia, who does it? You bring in Koreans. 
Thais, Filipinos. They do the work. And the Saudis don't think they should be doing that, that work. And you wonder to yourself, how long can this last, and is it healthy? So um, one of the questioners has raised uh, the issue of disparities uh, between the rich and poor. And of course, you know, the, the, the economic integration that we're seeing around the world that has created so much wealth, uh, by and large, lifted many, many from poverty. But it's also exacerbated disparities. Uh, how do you go around go about managing that problem and addressing those disparities, both domestically, because we're experiencing it here, and internationally? Well, I think disparity is dealt with best by prosperity, by rising economic opportunities that people have. President Kennedy said once, a rising tide lifts all the boats. Well, that's almost true. But there's some boats that have holes in them that leak. And so any good society has to have a safety net. And you have to be willing to put out your hand to people who, for one reason or another, uh, are having difficulty. I think that's clear. But you also have to figure out how you do it so you don't undermine the sense of I have responsibility for myself. And uh, I, I want to do things that support myself. Lee Kuan Yew, the fabled prime minister of Singapore, has a book out now. He gives his opinion about everything. And he's very blunt and crisp <laughs> and uh, precise. But he's very clear talks about Europe, that they've created a situation where they've undermined the sense that people might have of uh, responsibility for themselves. And when you do that, you don't, you're not creating a good society. So I think what we want is healthy economic growth, where people have opportunities. And uh, then when there are problems that people have, well, recognize them and deal with them in a thoughtful way. Um, and I think that's, that's the way to go. What we're seeing with these in a, in, in a knowledge economy is that the big determinant of whether you do well or not has everything to do with education, the quality of the education that was available to you. Um, say something about that as an expenditure? You know, we think of, you know, is that, in your view, a cost in governance, or is that an investment? Um, how, how should we be thinking about that? And, and have, we, uh, have we failed in our obligations to the next generation? We are failing our future, because our K-12 education system is broken in a great many respects. There are plenty of examples of outstanding K through 12 education, including in areas where you have people who are so-called deprived people that work. We know how to do it, but we're not doing it. And there are international tests that range us in the US has fallen back. And it's also very clear that the quality of your labor force as measured by things like math achievement or something like that are directly related to economic growth, which has to do with this problem you were talking about. And so I think this is probably, you asked for a domestic problem that we really should be addressing urgently, it's K through 12 education. And I don't see really that we're, well, we're beginning to step up to it. You see much more school choice going on, charter schools are developing, but in all too many cases, the schools are being run for the benefit of the people employed by the schools, rather than for the benefit of the students in them. And we have to change that and really get on the ball on K through 12 education. I think it's our biggest issue. Several of the questions. I have another, I, I say this in my book, I have a chapter on the economy and what to do about it, and this is one of the things to do about it. But then I have one other story about it. 
When I was Secretary of the Treasury, we had the air boy boycott, boycott, and oil prices went wild, and the financial system of the world was very upset by it. So I was in Rome for a meeting of the finance ministers in 1974. And my late wife, Obi, was a devout Irish Catholic, and it was arranged for her benefit that we would have a private audience with the Pope. So it was a great moment. So we go over to the Vatican. We are put in a holding room. Some rather stern Monsignor comes out and says, when the Holy Father is ready, you, he points to me, will come in for 10 minutes. Then he points to my wife and he says, and then you will come in for two minutes, during which time there will be pictures. He left. So we looked at each other, well, that's the deal, that's the deal. So we said, and out comes an American cardinal. Oh, you know, come on in, Holy Father's ready, let's go. And my wife, I said, come on in, she says, so we'll both go in. And we start talking about the oil crisis and the financial problems, and particularly how it affects the poorest countries in the world, which has been part of our uh, point in the discussions with the finance ministers. I was really astonished at how much the Pope knew about it. We're having this vivid, li lively conversation. It was fun. 15 minutes goes by, half an hour goes by, 40 minutes goes by. And I'm saying to myself, maybe it's up to me to end this conversation. <laughs> so I said to myself, why don't I end it on a humorous note? It had been a very mild winter that winter. So I said to him, Your Holiness, it's been a very mild winter that we've had this year. And none of us, the finance minister of the world over there, and none of us have been able to think of anything that's done as much good in this problem as the mild winter. And we thank you for your intervention. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't laugh. <laughs> he said, Mr. Secretary, you may be sure it will continue. <laughs> <laughs> and we had another mild winter the following year. So don't knock it. So some of the questioners are, are asking about times when either you felt policy was not being implemented, that things were happening against policy, or where you disagreed with the policy. So I'll, I'll go to the first one, um, and that's the Iran-Contra, what's referred to as the Iran-Contra affair, uh, that was really run out of the National Security Council, as I remember, Ed, and this is back when you were Secretary of State. You felt it was at variance with policy. What did you do? First of all, it was conducted by the NSC advisor and some people in the CIA. I didn't even know about it at first. I don't think they wanted me to know because they knew I would object. But anyway, when I knew about it, I, I said, this is a very bad idea. In the first place, you're selling arms to Iran. We are trying to avoid Iran getting arms. So it's against our policy. And you also are hoping you'll get our hostages out of it. In other words, you're trading arms for hostages. And when people who take hostages see that they can get paid for it, what does that do? It leads to more hostages. So this is a very bad policy. We have set it out, and we're opposed to it. I could see how it happened, because they knew that Ronald Reagan had a real soft spot for the people who held hostage over in Lebanon. It really bothered him. Here I am, President of the United States. These Americans are probably being tortured, and I can't do anything about it, really. So they went and they had this arms for hostage, and they said, by the way, Mr. President, we'll get our hostage. But anyway, I was opposed to it. Cap Weinberger was opposed to it. We both argued against it in meetings, but we lost. And I said, you know, among other things, this is inevitably going to leak. And then you're going to have trouble. I had, incidentally, I had a big fight with the CIA and some of the people in DOD because they got hooked on lie detector tests. Everybody gets wild about leaks, and they got to 
So they wanted to manage all high-level people through lie detector tests by fear. I said, I don't agree with that. That's not the way to manage people. You've got to manage people by trust and believe in them. And if you find somebody you can't trust, throw them away. But you've got to start with that, not fear. And I fought it. And I was away on a long trip. And somehow they managed to get this before the president. He signed in order that favored their point of view. And this became public. It was known what I thought. I was on this trip. I was asked about it. I said, it's a domestic matter. I won't talk about it. So I got back home. And I went down to our press room to announce a wonderful group we had to look at the problems in South Africa. And the first question I got was, OK, you're back home. Would you take a lie detector test? <laughs> I said, I'll take one once, then I'm out of here. If you make me take a lie detector test, you're telling me you don't trust me. If you don't trust me, I don't belong here. So hell, hell broke loose, and the president had me come over. I said, Mr. President, they came and got you to sign this. But look at this sign on your desk. It says there's no limit to what a man can accomplish, for he doesn't care who gets the credit. That's the way you try to manage, not this. So he rescinded what they had gotten across. And I never have recovered uh, with the CIA ever since. <laughs> but I said to, my, I said to them, look, I want to know about the policy, but you don't have to tell me all these details because it's going to leak, and then I don't, you're going to say I leaked it. So I'm, anyway, it leaks. I was in uh, Vienna when this all came out. I sent a cable back and said, we've seen this kind of thing before, and we get into this kind of a problem, the best thing to do is get it all out there immediately, warts and all. And I get back home, and incredibly to me, the people still wanted to keep going with the program. And I had about two or three weeks of intense fight about it, trying to get myself to the position where they would stop selling arms. And I was, I, you're always asked to appear on the Sunday shows. And finally, I got word that the president decided no more arms sales. So I accepted to go on, face the nation. Leslie Stahl was the interviewer. I can remember this interview so well. So we have this interview, and then she says, do you think we should sell arms to Iran? I said, no. Under the circumstances of Iran's support for terrorism, this, this, and this, no. I said, do you speak? Oh, I should say, I got this word then. About an hour before I was to go on, I get word, you can't say it because it's no longer the case. So, no. And then she said, do you speak for the administration? I said, no. The next morning, I was off to Chicago to give a speech. And I said to my staff, when I get back, I will no longer be Secretary of State. But as it happened, the White House blinked. And they put out a statement, I did speak for the administration. And that was the end of the arms sales. But it was a uh, battle royal, and uh, it, was, it was a downer in the Reagan administration. The only worst time was when we heard all the Marines were killed in that Marine barracks blow up in Beirut. But, um, but anyway, we got through it. My biggest, I, I did resign on principle once when I was Secretary of the Treasury. I could have felt, back when I was at OMB, I could feel the pressures beginning to build for wage and price controls. And I was very much opposed to it. And I made a speech entitled, Steady As You Go. And I argued, we had the budget under control. We had a sensible monetary policy. Inflation was too high. We were beginning to come down. And we need to stick to our strategy, and gradually it will come down, steady as you go. What to do? Nothing. Well, John Connolly came in, the big Texan doer. He was an attractive guy. 
And somebody asked him his position on something. He said, I can sell it round or I can sell it flat. Tell me. Anyway, we had to go off the gold, close the gold window, because there was going to be a run in the bank. And he used that argument to persuade the president to go for wage and price control, which was a mess. At that time, I was director of the budget, so it wasn't in my direct line of responsibility. Then I became Secretary of Treasury. So I find myself administering these things. You know who the guys reporting to me were? Don Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney. <laughs> and that's, Don doesn't have that on his resume. <laughs> but uh, we were in the process of dismantling them. And President Nixon decided to reimpose them. And I thought it was a very bad idea. And I told him so, but he didn't anyway. So I said, well, Mr. President, it's your call. I think it's wrong. But this is a big policy issue. It's my area. So you've got to find yourself a new Secretary of the Treasury. And I resigned. So I think you, you asked about some things you disagree with. Well, you disagree with them, so you go along. But something big and fundamental like that, it's in your area of responsibility. And the president's view is very different from yours. You've got to get out and make way for somebody else. So I did. So I'm going to try to cover four very large topics in a very short period of time. But these are the topics Others that got. You're telling me to be shorter in my response. The, well, these are, these are the topics that had the most question cards associated with them. One. Uh, is, is a question about the NSA uh, uh, surveillance and da data mining. Um, and the questioner asked whether you have any suggestions for the director of uh, NSA uh, as to how to, uh, how to restore trust uh, while at the same time doing the job of, uh, of trying to deal with terrorism. When I was made Secretary of Labor, I was new to Washington. And I was looking for a press person. And one of the outstanding reporters in the labor area was a man named Joe Loftus, who reported for the New York Times. And he'd been at it a long time. And I asked him, and to my delight and surprise, he was at least interested. So we had an interview. And he said, I'll come, but I have conditions. And he had a variety of conditions. The first one was, don't lie. I said, come on, Joe, I don't lie. So you'd be surprised at what happens to people when they come down here and they get under pressure and they try to obscure things. Not only don't lie, but don't mislead. And I think the first thing I would say to the people in intelligence and the NSA, don't lie. Don't mislead. They have. And in a sense, in a way, it is. I don't think it's so much the things they're doing that are bothering people, but the fact that they haven't been honest about it. Mm -hmm. You've got to be honest with people. So that's the first thing I would tell them. And the second thing is, only do the things you really need to do. Some of the reach of what they're doing is breathtaking. And I can see the importance of monitoring and trying to put calls together and so on. That makes perfect sense. And I think that it's important to do it. And I compliment them on what they have developed to help protect us against terrorism. But don't go too far. So I think they have overstepped and they, and they have not been honest with us. And I think that's undermining them. And they've got to correct that. And I don't know how the guy who's the head of national intelligence, Clapper, I think, I don't know why he's still there. He lied. You can't do that. He should have been fired. So let me take you to another that's, hot. I mean, that, I don't think anybody's ever said that around him, but that's my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Um, several of the question cards start with, what advice would you give President Obama? And I've been a little nervous about asking those questions. <laughs> goes, but but let, me, let me go to another one. There were several questioners about, lots about uh, the war on terror. Uh, you, give, you devote uh, a good deal of attention to uh, uh, terrorism in your book. Um, 
one questioner asked, or actually about four questioners asked about the use of drones. There's a situation where we've had a technology advantage, these unmanned vehicles, um, and, uh, and we've taken advantage of that technology advantage, but we won't have that advantage for long. Should we be thinking about rules, rules of the road for the use of unmanned vehicles like this? Well, we can think about them and talk about them a little bit. I don't know how far you're actually going to get with it. But if we have a technology that's useful to us, we should use it. And of course, you use it carefully and with a certain amount of discretion because you don't want too much pushback. But uh, as far as I can see, the drones have been used well. I, don't ha I think that a good job has been done that, and we have taken out many, many terrorists with them. And I believe that even the people who are objecting are kind of doing it for the record in many cases, and they're happy enough to see that we've rid the world of quite a few terrorists in the process. And with, in, in, I mean, the notion is with considerably less collateral damage. Absolutely. And risk to ourselves. But it's true what you say. Technology is marching on fast. And unmanned vehicles of all sorts are going to be produced, and they're going to be a big problem. And they'll be in hands that are not necessarily very responsible. And uh, what people can find out with them is breathing. I, I have a little place in the Berkshires in Massachusetts. We've had it a long time. Just out in the sticks, nothing. No big deal. So just for fun, I went on Google Maps. They know everything that's going on in my little backyard. I say, come on, whose business is there? Is there? What, what is, we, we are living in a transparent society. And I guess we have to get used to it, but it, you, you have to say that's the world we're living in. This is how you knew about Charlotte's redecoration. <laughs> He was checking it out on Google Maps. But let me, while we're on technology, move to nuclear weapons, because there was a situation where we had a, uh, an advantage for a long time, and we took advantage of that moment to start thinking about what are the rules of the road with, with nuclear weapons? What, you know, how do you control their use? How do you minimize their spread? Um, you were there in an extraordinary moment in history in Reykjavik with President Reagan when he, and I believe what he did was he first said, let's abolish ballistic missiles. And then said, tell me if I'm wrong on this, and then moved to the abolition of nuclear weapons. So I wanted to first make sure that the, I've got the facts right, but secondly, get a sense of what was your response at the time? Were you, were you pleased? Did you see this as a, an important turning point? And what are your views now when it comes to nuclear weapons and their control? Early in his presidency, President Reagan asked the Joint Chiefs of Staff to tell him what would happen in the United States if there were an all-out Soviet attack on us with nuclear weapons. A few weeks later, they came back with their response. Initial casualties, 150 million, with untold follow-on casualties because we have no infrastructure left. In other words, it would wipe us out as a country. Would he retaliate? Yes. What would happen? So I heard him say many, many times, what's so good about keeping the peace by an ability to wipe each other out? So he became, and I agreed with him, an advocate of getting rid of nuclear weapons. Up until then, any negotiation was limiting the increase. He said we should decrease them. The Soviets had intermediate range nuclear forces. They were designed strategically to separate us from Europe. That is, they would hit Europe and not the US. And with the US, US route, we're nuclear attack on us in defending Europe. That was their object. They had about 1,500 deployed. We had none deployed. And our proposal was, we both are at zero. People said it's a ridiculous proposal to think that we can negotiate that. 
Well, we did get some deployed, and we had a hard negotiation. And we finally did reach that conclusion, zero reduction. And we also had proposed that strategic arms be cut in half nuclear arms to equal levels. It was also dismissed. But in the end, it came about. President Reagan said on many occasions publicly that he advocated the abol abolition of nuclear weapons. And but even before the Reykjavik, there was exchanges back and forth with the Soviets where this was very much on the table. So from our standpoint, it wasn't a total surprise at Reykjavik that this would emerge. But how do I interpret what's happened? Where are we today and where should we be trying to go? We have always been aware of the fact that nuclear weapons pose a gigantic threat to us, humanity. Think, a nuclear weapon incinerates the Bay Area. Ding, like that, what a weapon. President Eisenhower, who in a biography recently I learned, he first learned about the existence of nuclear weapons at Potsdam. And our plan was to drop them on Japan, and he was the only person at Potsdam who opposed it. Twice during his presidency, all of his advisors had advised him to use nuclear weapons, and he didn't do it. And he proposed his Atoms for Peace program. President Kennedy, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, spoke eloquently at Georgetown University about the importance of getting rid of nuclear weapons. President Nixon signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty. So this subject was very much on people's mind, but what was going on with nuclear weapons? Well, they were just going up. And they reached a peak in 1986, sort of at the time of the Reykjavik meeting between President Reagan and General Secretary Gorbachev. It was an extraordinary meeting. We were in this little room in a place called Hofti House in Reykjavik. President Reagan's on one end of this little table, Gorbachev on the other end. I'm sitting beside President Reagan. Never Shevard Nazi, the Soviet foreign minister, is beside Gorbachev. And there are no takers and interpreters there, but it's though there are just four people in this little room for two hours, for two days. And we talked about everything, including getting rid of nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles. In the end, there was a, and Gorbachev put everything conditional on us fundamentally ending our program of research on how to defend ourselves against ballistic missiles. And the president wouldn't give in on that, and I certainly agreed with him. This is the Strategic Defense Initiative, yeah. SDI. There was a poignant exchange at the end, and Gorbachev says to Reagan, Mr. President, if we agree to get rid of ballistic missiles, why do you need a defense against them? And the president said, because people know how to make them. And there will always be some rogue state that comes along. And when that happens, you and I will both be glad that we know how to defend ourselves against them. And he said, and, and if we learn how to do this, we will share our technology with you. And Gorbachev said, Mr. President, you won't even share milk technology with us. <laughs> the end of that discussion. However, and when I came back to Washington after, you know, Margaret Thatcher virtually summoned me to the British ambassador's residence. You know, she always carried a little stiff handbag. And I learned there's a verb in the British language well, to be handbagged for Margaret. <laughs> so I got handbagged. George, how can you sit there and allow the president to agree to get rid of nuclear weapons? I said, but Margaret, he's the president. Yes, but you're supposed to be the one with his feet on the ground. But Margaret, I agree with him. <laughs> but there was a general reaction like that. However, it changed the atmosphere. And an unnoticed agreement that was reached at Reykjavik 
was in a very important negotiation conducted by a wonderful woman named Rose Ridgway, who was my assistant secretary for uh, European Soviet affairs. And she negotiated the first formal agreement with the Soviets that human rights would be a recognized regular item on our agenda. So that was the beginning, you could see, of the Soviets beginning to see that their internal arrangements needed to change. But at any rate, the atmosphere changed. And you, in your chart, if you say nuclear weapons, they just went up like this in 1986, and then they come down. They're about 25, 30% of what they were at their height now. So there's been a huge amount of reduction. And I've been working on this more recently. And my friend Bill Perry and Sam Nunn and Henry Kissinger, Sid Drella, we've been working on it hard. And we published. And there was a big resonance all over the world to this. But in the last few years, it has gone flat. And people now see proliferation is coming at us. North Korea has a nuclear weapon. Pakistan is building its arsenal. Great tension between India and Pakistan. Iran is on its way to having a nuclear weapon, apparently. I don't know if who's going to do anything about it, but uh, that's where they're going. Anybody who thinks otherwise has got rose-colored glasses. Uh, so the atmosphere has changed. And I think we have to rearrange the conditions and get back on the offensive on this, because the proliferation, if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, most people think that the Saudis will buy one from Pakistan. And who else over there gets them? The more, people, more countries that have them, the more chance there is that we'll want to be used. The more fissile material is lying around. It's the fissile material that's the critical point in making a nuclear weapon. That's hard to make. But if you have it, it's not a piece of cake to make a nuclear weapon, but MIT students can do it. It's not that difficult. So it's a dangerous time, and we've got to get back on the offensive on this, I think. So this last story about Margaret Thatcher makes me kind of know the answer to one of the questions. In fact, there were several people asked what, who were the leaders you admired most and then made the mistake of asking what his qualities were. And I have a feeling it may have been her qualities. Um, am I right that Margaret Thatcher was somebody well, you particularly Thatcher, respected? Margaret Thatcher, I thought, was a great leader. We had a good, close relationship with her. We didn't agree all the time. We had some real fights. But nevertheless, on fundamental things, we were in agreement with her. And she was a great favorite of the president's. She was our last state visitor. And that was deliberate. And whenever there's a state visit, the Secretary of State gets to give a luncheon for the visitor. So I gave a luncheon for Margaret, who I knew quite well. And what happens at these luncheons is I give a toast, she gives a toast. Somebody sent up a toast for me to give about our two countries. And I said, oh, no, can't do that. So I racked my brain. I said, OK, we're going to have a different toast. So I got one of the ladies in my office to shop around and find a handbag like the one that Margaret carried. And then she had these, the gift of very short, pithy, hard-hitting statements on various subjects, on terrorism or something. And I got about eight of them, and I had them typed up on little cards, and I put them in this handbag. <laughs> and my toast was to say to her, now, uh, Prime Minister, I want to award you the first and perhaps the only grand order of the handbag. And he said, far be it for me to look in a lady's handbag, let alone Margaret Thatcher's handbag. But I'm going to look in this. And I pulled out these quotes, and I read them off. She loved it. It was a great moment. But she was a great leader. But we had a lot of people that were first class. Gorbachev, of course, was a huge mind and influence. In Helmut Schmidt, Kohl in Germany, Giscard d'Estaing in France. We had Nakasone in Japan. We had Lee Kuan Yew on the scene. 
uh, Deng Xiaoping in China. Deng Xiaoping was a giant. Uh, my last visit in China, Secretary of State in 1988, and I had a session with him. I'd had quite a few. At this moment, Gorbachev's reforms were sort of riding high, and I asked him, what do you think of Gorbachev's reforms? Deng Xiaoping was very blunt. He said in so many words, he said, he's got it all backwards. He's opened up the political system. He doesn't know what to do about the economy. It's going to blow up in his face, just like that. Turned out to be very prophetic. So I said, well, what about China? He said, I'm doing it right. He said, I know the Chinese people. I started with agriculture, then small businesses. They respond. It's working. People want more of what's working, so I expanded. Now we're ready for the two openings. We're open and I say, what are they? Well, opening, first of all, within China, people can move around. Second opening is to the outside world. And I might say, he said, and I'm glad there's a reasonably coherent world to open up to. But uh, there's that. So I said, well, what about your political system? He said, it'll happen the same way. There'll be, in communities, more representative government gradually. It'll come up. But we'll always have a strong center because China is very diverse, and you have to have a strong center to hold it together. So that was his prediction. But uh, he was, he was a, a terrific a man. You could just feel it. And Zhu Rangji, later on finance minister was, and premier, was one of the outstanding people I ever met. So we had a lot of great leaders in those days. And uh, you not least among them. So please join me in thanking George Shultz.